Hello everybody, welcome back to the LAB News Studio. It's been a while, but I enjoy reporting the news and there's some good juicy stuff to report this week, so I thought I'd share it with you. First of all, DWF are gonna float on the stock market. News reports say that it hopes to raise 75 million pounds when it floats on the main market next month. Sources say that the cash raise is expected to repay a portion of the members' capital contributions, invest in operations and infrastructure, and fund what are described as strategic initiative changes programs. There is also scope for potential funding for future acquisitions. A source from DWF reporting exclusively for LAB says this. It's a very exciting time to be the first law firm to float on the full London Stock Exchange. It shows what an innovative and forward-thinking firm we are at DWF and allows the employees to become stakeholders in the firm and empower them, a bit like John Lewis do with their staff. It will allow further investment to improve many things to make us more effective and provide an even better client service. All this will allow us to take the firm to the next level. Now, I am certainly no expert in the stock market or corporate law, but I'm gonna give you some background information to this, which should hopefully help you. Historically, law firms have been run under the partnership model, where the business is essentially owned and run by the partners in the business. As of the Legal Services Act 2007, which I've talked about in previous videos, law firms were essentially allowed to open out and have non-law investment. Now, most law firms who chose to live life as an ABS did so by way of private equity investment. And actually not many firms have chose to float on the stock market. Gately PLC was the first to do so in 2015, and that was then followed by Keystone Law and Gordon Dads in 2017. But DWF will actually be the first one to float on the main London stock exchange market. Why would a law firm want to do this? Essentially to generate extra investment. It widens the pool of investors and therefore the amount of money that can be invested and they can then invest that money in whatever projects they choose to. As DWF have indicated, they want to invest in infrastructure and operations along with a variety of other things. What are the drawbacks? Increased regulation because if you're offering your shares out to members of the public, those shareholders have to be protected and therefore any company who chooses to float on the stock market is subject to increased regulation and there are also associated costs with go with that which go with that increase in regulation and change in structure of the business. DWF has chosen to allocate 25% of their share capital to what's known as an IPO and that's an initial public offering which essentially means that that 25% will be offered on the open stock market to public investors. Why is this interesting to you? Well, it's definitely interesting if you're applying to DWF because it's massive. So if you are going forward to an assessment center or an interview, you must be aware of this because it's something that you might want to raise or ask questions about in the context of an interview. Secondly, this is interesting for a whole host of other reasons because it creates all sorts of interesting moral and ethical questions about whether law firms should float on the stock market. I'm not gonna go into all of them now because fortunately Legal Cheek have put together a really good article which covers a number of these issues and if you were asked to talk about potential changes in the marketplace which have moral or ethical considerations associated with them then this is a really good one to talk about particularly because DWF has just announced its plans to float on the stock market. Next up the not so happy story of Emily Scott who was recently struck off by the SRA. Emily Scott was a trainee solicitor at a firm called DeVita Platt where she was subjected to horrible working conditions where she was bullied, manipulated, and deceived into falsifying documents and doing a number of other unscrupulous things which were prohibited by the SRA. After leaving the firm, Emily then reported these activities to the SRA. The SRA took the matter to tribunal and at tribunal, DeVita and Platt were struck off for their activities, but somewhat controversially, so was Emily. Emily's hit back in the press and says she feels understandably let down by the authorities because she was the one who essentially whistle blew on the activities and stopped them from deceiving any more people. And she was given assurances by her employer that she would be protected because notably the SRA offers protection for whistleblowers under certain circumstances. The SRA have come back and said they absolutely stand by their decision to strike Emily off because although she was the one who blew the whistle, she acted dishonestly for a period of time and she failed to bring this dishonesty to the attention of the SRA for some considerable time afterwards. I think everybody feels for Emily in this situation because being a trainee solicitor is incredibly stressful and you're under a huge amount of pressure to perform well and do what is being asked of you. However, I think the moral of this story, which the SRA are trying to get across, is that even if you are a very junior lawyer, you still have obligations to the SRA to act with dishonesty 
and integrity and no amount of poor working conditions or pressure can absolve you of those responsibilities. So this is something to really think carefully about as you're moving forward into your role as a trainee solicitor because it is an incredibly high pressure environment and you can think that qualifying and that job is the absolute be all and end all. However, if you're being asked to do something that you know is wrong, the moral of this story is just don't do it because the consequences of that can be absolutely dire. Yes, standing up for yourself may result in you being taken off that piece of work or worst case scenario, fired, which I hope would never happen, but life does go on. However, if you do something which is in breach of your SRA obligations and it's found out, the consequences are so dire. Being struck off is the end of your career full stop and no matter what it is, it's simply not worth it. Solicitors make mistakes all the time. We are only human, but if you do make a mistake, own up to it and it can be dealt with. It won't be fun, but life goes on. But being struck off is the end of your career and there is nothing that is worth risking that for. The SRA have always taken a really hard line when it comes to any kind of dishonesty and I'm gonna link another article which illustrates this below. So even if you're tempted to cover something up or tell a little lie, it's just not worth it because the SRA are so hard on you if you do that. Okay, on to some happier news. I'm in the news twice this week, once for a really good win that I had in court earlier this week for my client who tragically lost her husband in a trail biking accident in Spain a few years ago. We have been pursuing this case for a few years and trying to get some vital documents from her late husband's employer, which we've been struggling to do. And we finally made an application to court and the court found in our favor. So we've been successful and now we can get these documents through and hopefully make some vital progress in her claim. Secondly, Legal Cheek have voted Law and Broader one of the top 10 best uses of social media in law this year, which is fantastic. So really pleased about that. And hopefully you guys agree with that decision. It's not an award that you can be nominated for or be voted for. So it's just something that Legal Cheek have decided, which was a lovely surprise. And I'm gonna link the article below along with all the other articles that I've mentioned today, cause the other nine people in that list are also extremely influential when it comes to legal profession. So all those of you who are looking for training contracts or pursuing a career in law, you should definitely follow and engage with all of those other nine people in that list. Final thing that I wanna mention is that you know that I will have a real passion for conserving mental health health in the legal profession and the junior lawyers division are conducting a survey for junior lawyers mental health in the workplace which is currently open I think it closes at the end of next week but it would be really really helpful for those of you who are currently working in the legal profession whatever capacity if you could fill it in even if you think your working environment is wonderful and you don't struggle with mental health issues the report on the survey is meant to give an accurate reflection of how things really are so I would be really grateful if you could put your thoughts into that survey I will link it below also if you have any concerns about mental health there's a lady from the JLD called Kaylee Leone, whose details I'll link below as well, who is really pioneering this mental health for junior lawyers. So if you've got any questions or any concerns, I'm sure she wouldn't mind you getting in contact with her or me, of course. I don't mind if you have issues that you want to discuss or you're worried about anything, then I'm more than happy to talk to you and try and help you resolve them. Okay, that's it. Of course, all of the articles are linked in the description below, plus any satellite articles, which I think might be of relevance to you. I hope you found that helpful. As always, please give me some feedback let me know what you think and what you'd like me to do differently or whether you'd like to see more of this in the future catch up with you guys in a couple of weeks bye